from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and uh, thank you for coming out on this beautiful morning. It, it, uh, I had about five different outfits that I was planning to wear for today, and they all got shelved. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the National Book Festival. Uh, I have the pleasure today of interviewing Don Winslow, and as some of you maybe read me in the Washington Post, I'm a regular mystery columnist for the Washington Post, as well as a book critic for Fresh Air on National Public Radio, both of which uh, are supporters of the National Book Festival. After my conversation with Don, he will be signing books from 11 to 12, and um, I think once you hear some more about The Force, if you haven't had the pleasure of reading it already, you will want to grab a book and get it signed. Um, I was in St. Louis in April. I was at a fundraiser for the St. Louis Library. It was a fundraiser organized around the theme of a mystery night, a suspense night. Reed Farrell Coleman, who is a fantastic hard-boiled detective fiction writer, sponsors the event, and he had gotten other great writers like Peter Blauner, Hilary Davidson, Blake Crouch to come to the event and to talk about their suspense fiction. And guess what? All of those terrific writers were talking about this novel. They were saying to me, you've got to read it. This is the suspense novel of the year. Uh, they were so in awe of the research, of the writing, quality of, of Don's novel. I went home, and as you can see, I started to read it. These are all my posted notes. It's a fantastic police procedural. It's a fantastic novel about New York, but like all the greatest crime fiction, it's also a terrific novel about that struggle between justice and the law, and the gap between justice and the law. Don has uh, an a biography the likes of which I've never seen before at the National Book Festival. <laughs> I mean, in addition to being a guide in China, um, to leading a safari, a photographic safari, he's also written, what is it, 19 novels? Yes, 19 novels, many of which have been made into major motion pictures. He also was awarded the LA Times Book Prize in 2016, and um, I am just so excited to have him here at the festival and to be able to talk with him about The Force. So please welcome Don Winslow. I always imagine that these audiences are composed of people who've already had the good sense to read your book, but some folks who haven't. Would, could you do the, the two-minute sort of summary of what The Force is about? Yeah, I'll, I'll, wow, that's, that's heavy mic. <laughs> and if people want to move up, by the way, it's not SeaWorld. You won't get splashed. <laughs> you don't need a cover. It's, it's, and the author's relatively harmless in, in this case. So. Please move up if you'd like. Uh, the Force uh, refers to a, a fictional special unit inside the New York Police Department that's been charged with taking guns and drugs off the streets of Upper Manhattan, Upper West Side, Harlem, Inwood, Washington Heights. And they're very good at what they do. Uh, they get to be too good at what they do. And I'm not giving anything really away. It's in the first few pages of the book. Uh, they make one of the biggest heroin and cash busts in New York City history, and they keep half of it for themselves. And things go from there. One of the things that the, your colleagues in the suspense world were raving about was the amount of research that went into this novel, um, but of course didn't bog down in any way the narrative, but they were just talking about the authenticity of the details and the way cops speak to each other and the kind of situations that they encounter that you don't get from your usual you know, cop TV show. T 
talk a little bit about the research, that process of research. How did you even get, most of them are guys, guys yeah. who, who do that kind of work to, to open up to you? You know, I, I call it the, the chair factor. You know, first of all, I've been around cops my whole life. My godfather was a cop. I worked in New York City as a, as a PI, mm -hmm. you know, on Times Square. So I, I dealt with cops a lot. So I've worked with cops. I've worked cases against cops um, in, in Los Angeles. So I, I've been around them my whole adult life. Uh, but specifically for this book, it was a matter not so much of having interviews, but becoming the chair. You, you know how when you buy a new chair or a new sofa, for the first couple of weeks, you go in the room, and that's all you see. It's the chair, it's the sofa, it's new, it's there, it dominates the room. A couple of weeks later, it's the chair, you know? And so I think for researching any book like this is largely a matter of becoming the chair, you know, just to be there. Um, and it's like any relationship. It takes time, you know? Uh, and to sit and to listen and, and to hear what they say and, and to ask fewer and fewer questions, really, yeah. you know. Did you ride along? Did mm -hmm. you, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I interrupted. No, you. I, yeah. I mean, I, you're in when you read when you read the force. You, the reader, are in those tenement hallways doing what yeah. your guys call the verticals, going up the stairs. Up and down uh, the stairs, yeah. You know, you're talking to the. Uh, the informants in the alleys. You, 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 know, you have a real sense of where folks who do this kind of work would meet an informant right. and um, what, the, what the terrain is like. As, as your characters point out in The Force, cops don't like to bear their souls to anybody who's not in the club. Yeah. So was it the PI credential? No, not at all. Typically cops don't like PIs, you know. Um, so that was not an advantage yeah. at all. Uh, no, it was, um, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard, you know, only other cops can understand me. Yeah. Yeah. I only talk to other cops, and I, and I think that that's a, a real factor, and I, I get it, I understand why. Uh, again, it was a matter of patience, mm -hmm. and it was a matter of, I think, empathy. You know, I, I rarely go in and ask, what did you do, what happened? We, we kind of already know those things. Yeah. You know, and, and from being around and going on ride-alongs, but uh, the sort of conversation I'd start, and some of these conversations went on for years, by the way, you know, I would simply say, tell me about it. You know, keep it as open-ended as possible, and, and there were, were veteran cops and retired cops, and my, my wife came along on some of these, actually, which was a big help, because I think that they opened up to her, maybe in ways they wouldn't have opened up to me talking about cases that had happened 10, 20 years ago yeah. that I don't think they ever talked about. And all of a sudden, you're looking at this very tough veteran homicide cop, mm -hmm. with tears streaming down his face. You know? I, I, I can understand that from some of the stories that you have the characters tell in the book. Yeah, um, they're all true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, did you record those no, conversations? No, 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 never. Uh, don't record, don't take notes. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants that. It, it makes you instantly unwelcome. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a journalist. You know, I, don't, I, I try to make it as realistic and as factually driven as I can, but I don't have the responsibility that journalist has yeah. for absolute truth and accuracy. I'm still a fiction writer. But no, for me to have had a microphone would not have worked mm -hmm. in this situation at all, or even to be sitting there you know, with the legal pad that I would like to have had. You know, uh, and taking things down would have inhibited those conversations and inhibited those moments. It, it, I wouldn't have been the chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, did any of them ask if they could read what a draft? Of, no. Of this? Okay. No. Uh, I, I took that off the table. Yeah. You know. Uh, listen, I, I, some of them have really liked the book. Uh, others have not. Mm -hmm. um, some, you know a little bit of both, right. you know, and, and, and that's what I expected. But for the most part, the reaction has been very positive. But no, I, I would never let a subject mm -hmm. read, you know, maybe for yeah. factual things, you know, could you check on this, right. is that realistic or, or that sort of thing. But to give like pages or chapters, no. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard time to write about the police, it of is. course, and, yeah. and you dramatize that in the force as well. Um, and a, a few times in this novel, you have 
characters making a variation of kind of the same speech, but it's an important speech, where these detectives say, you know, you're not the one who goes up those stairs. You're not the one speaking usually to a bureaucrat. You're not the right. one who breaks in the door. You're not the one who has to do this dirty work. Right. So don't judge us. Yeah. And, and I think as a, as a novelist, you had to walk a, a, kind of a fine line here because you wanted, obviously, to write this kind of morally complex novel, but um, I guess I guess the, the times that we live in now, where where you know there will cops have to deal with accusations of racism and you know sometimes maybe they're founded, sometimes they're not. It may, it must have made your job harder in terms of dramatizing these characters and and giving them a, a fully realized life and world. Yeah, you know, it is a difficult time to write about cops, a difficult time to be a cop. Yeah. It's a difficult time to be, I think, particularly a young African American mm -hmm. in, in treacherous situations with mm -hmm. cops. You know, I think that we need to look at that racial situation and know that that's very real. Mm -hmm. uh, and I write about it in the book. I'll, I'll probably regret saying this, but I'm not very interested in morality when I'm writing. Mm. You know, I'm not, I'm not interested in saying that's a good guy, that's a bad guy, this is right, this is wrong. Um, I, I think it's my job is to take the reader into a world that, that he or she otherwise couldn't go into. Yeah. Or if they do know that world, to maybe show it to them in a slightly different way. And to do that, I need to get inside the characters' heads, whether they're clean cops or dirty cops or drug dealers or informants or whatever it is. If I'm going to do my job well, then I need to be subjective when I'm actually typing, when I'm actually writing. I can't be interested in stepping outside the character and saying, that's right, that's wrong, yeah. that's good, that's bad, yeah. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, another thing that comes up a couple of times in the novel is this idea of every institution believing its, its own mythology, yeah. whether it's, you know, the organized crime, whether it's the mob, uh, whether it's the police force, I don't know, whether it's an academic institution, they've all got their own mythology. And one of the things I admired so much about the force is you've got some of the mythic elements of the police procedural, you know, the young cop, who, the young detective yeah. who has to learn the ropes. Right. And uh, you know, some of those characters who uh, we, we read these stories for, but you sort of, as a novelist, you, you seem to be able to surmount the mythology and break through. And, and well, I, I, I wonder how much, as, as a writer, you're, you're thinking about the formula and how to tinker with it as you're writing. Yeah, you know, I was, as a kid, very influenced by those sort of classic 1970s books and films, mm -hmm. The French Connection, mm -hmm. uh, Serpico, Prince of the City. Yeah. I knew the Prince of the City, huh. a friend of mine, yeah. a friend of Reed's. And, uh, and they were part of what inspired me to want to be a crime writer. Mm -hmm. You know, if I could tell stories like that, you know, that, that would be a great way to live, yeah. right? So we're all aware, I think, of, the, of that and the tropes that, that exist, mm -hmm. you know, within that genre. I, I think sometimes, though, what, what I try to do is acknowledge them. You know, they're yeah. very real. And, Partly they're real because they're real, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. because yeah. those yeah. characters and those situations exist. But then sort of point the story true north toward those and then kick it a little bit. <laughs> it's nice. You know yeah. what I mean? Just, yeah. just if you nudge it like five degrees off center, um, when you start a chapter or start a sequence, then sometimes interesting things can happen. So you, know, you must know that I'm going to ask you how you got into writing from the world of action, being a PI, traveling, it seems like, around the globe. Yeah. What, what made you decide that you could try your hand at actually writing one of these things? You know, I, I've always wanted to be a writer since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the world didn't agree for a long time with <laughs> right. that assessment. So I had to make a living. I, as you alluded to, I majored in African history, mm -hmm. which makes you a hardcore unemployable, the only person in the world. <laughs> who's ever managed to make a living at it is Dane Kennedy, my African history professor, sitting over there. 
Um, he took all the money the rest of us could have made. <laughs> uh, kept it. Uh, so I, you know, I went out to become a safari guide and all that, that kind of thing. But then, uh, I, I think for a while, you know, I wouldn't come here to, to lie to you. I mean, I think for a while I just lost confidence. Yeah. You know, thinking that, you know, can I really do this? Can I pull this off? And I was cobbling together a living doing various things, leading photographic safaris, directing mm -hmm. Shakespeare in, right. in England, being a PI, you know, various times of the year, seasonally, <laughs> doing that kind of work. And then I heard Joe Wambau um, on the radio say that uh, when he was an LA homicide investigator, that he wanted to be a writer. And that, that he told himself he would write 10 pages a day, no matter what. And I said to myself, well, I, I can't do 10, but I could do five, you know? I could just do, f and so I did. And, and I was in a tent in Kenya uh, with amoebic dysentery. I weighed about <laughs> 99 pounds. Hey. And, uh, and I thought, no, but I'm going to write five pages a day no matter what. And then three years later, I had my first book. Well, I thought it was my first book. Yeah. The first 14 publishers did not think it was <laughs> my first book. But the 15th did, and, and I've been very, very blessed, very lucky. I've been under contract since then. Mm -hmm. uh, the writing in a tent in Kenya, you, you're going into Hemingway territory there. I mean. <laughs> uh, who? L literally. Yeah. Uh, no, no, our, our cook, huh. uh, who was a, a very old man named Katoya, was a young man and an assistant on the Hemingway Green Hills of Africa oh, please. safari. And the, the only words in English that he spoke were Johnny Walker. <laughs> uh, but, wow. but he and I would have conversations about Papa Hemingway yeah. in, you know, in Swahili. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 slight digression, I had the opportunity to see Hemingway's house in Sun Valley oh, is that right? two summers yeah. ago. And that's, of course, where he committed suicide. Sure. It's an eerie place because yeah. you can't open any of the windows. Huh. They're all plexiglass wow. and it has a real sealed in huh. feeling. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Who else did you read? Wamba? You know, everyone you'd expect. Yeah. You know, Ed McBain? Sure, Ed McBain. And I was you know, very aware. You have to be aware of Ed McBain when you're writing an NYPD novel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you, yeah. you just do. Um, you know, uh, Lawrence Block mm -hmm. was a huge influence. Yeah. Uh, Elmore Leonard, of yeah. course. Mr. Yeah. Leonard, you know, shortly before he passed away, I, I got to spend 45 minutes with him on the phone. Huh. You know, 45 of the happiest yeah. minutes of my life. I've been in awe of him forever. He got on the phone and he said, uh, Don Winslow, <laughs> you were two years old when I wrote 310 to Yuma. <laughs> and I said, yes, Mr. Leonard, but I tried to read it. You know? <laughs> and, um, nice. Uh, nice. It was the most charming way of putting me in my place. Yeah. You know, but, but who you'd expect? Raymond Chandler, of course. I could go on and on. Charles Williford. Oh, yeah. Charles you know, Williford. John D. McDonald, mm -hmm. Ross McDonald, mm -hmm. um, all of those people. You know, James Elroy, uh, T. Jefferson Parker, who's since mm -hmm. become a dear friend. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. yeah. I, I'm always afraid of answering that question know, for yeah. leaving someone <laughs> out. Because yeah. I read everybody. I, I read on stakeouts, which is probably why I was a lousy PI. Oh. You know? <laughs> huh, something just happened. <laughs> so. you, usually, in, in, uh, at least in the classic novels, like the Chandler novels, you know, Marlowe is reading and then looks up just the right moment. Yeah, but I guess yeah she was blonde, beautiful, and dead. <laughs> yes, yeah, and yes. trumpets played. <laughs> that yeah. never happened to me. I got the blonde and beautiful part, but no trumpets. You know. So. Well, this is a serious novel, but it's got its lighter moments. Yeah. And one of the episodes I really enjoyed is when the force, this group of elite detectives, well, Denny Malone, the head of the force, yeah. decides he needs to reward the guys who work with him. And they go out on bowling night, with, yeah. which is actually what? Do you want to talk? A, a, a drunken, drug-fueled orgy. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, the scene that I like in that is when they all sit around at dinner. It, bowling night yeah. starts with you have to order steaks at a very expensive yeah. old-fashioned place called Gallagher's, and you must wear a suit, and you must wear French cufflinks, and you really have to do it up. Yeah. And they sit and they order steaks because mob guys hang out in there, and if they see cops ordering anything less expensive, it lessens their power and prestige, yeah. um, which is a truth. Yeah. So uh, they sit around and tell stories. 
uh, those are all true stories, by the way. Yeah. I, 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 too, like the detail about the stake, and it feeds into a pattern where these detectives are very aware of appearance. Yes. Uh, and, and when they're out, out on the streets, how they're carrying themselves yeah. uh, so that they're not underestimated. And that must be, I, I would think that would be a huge psychic strain year after year to sort of always have, have that double consciousness yeah. of how you're being perceived. And I think it's all a huge psychic strain. Yeah. By the way, everyone and their dog tried to take that sequence out of the book. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because it's just four guys sitting around for about 40 pages telling no, old stories. It's a great sequence. Uh, and everyone tried to cut it and take it out, and I got really stubborn mm -hmm. about it and just Good. kept writing stat, you know, leave it alone, <laughs> it stays in, it stays in. Good. But yeah, I think it is a strain, but these, these sort of rock star cops <coughs> mm -hmm. are very aware of image, and uh, they have a, a charisma about them and a magnetism about them that is palpable when you step into the room. Mm -hmm. Not just in New York, when you meet these guys you know, anywhere. Uh, and women, by the way, mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And they're very, very aware of it, and it's, it helps them succeed in their jobs, but it's also a survival tool. It really is. It's a, it's an instant sort of warning that creates distance and space and time for them to think of the solution of the problem that's in front of them and to persuade people to do what they want them to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You do mention that the, the two female detectives mm -hmm. who make appearances here, one of them more than the other, yeah. that they're tougher than anybody you're likely to meet. Yeah. And, and I guess that there too, you would have to be. They have to be. I mean, the women cops, and it's still the truth, have to be twice as good, mm -hmm. you know, to, yeah. to get to that, that position. Um, and they are, you know, very, very tough, very smart. You wouldn't mess with them. Yeah. I wouldn't want to. No. <laughs> In addition to being a really, outs I've run out of adjectives, outstanding police procedural, um, this is a great novel about New York. And I, I was born in New York, I told you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I teach a course at Georgetown on New York literature. Oh, wow. Maybe you'd like to come. I'd love to. Uh, come. But Please. <laughs> Let's go now. Let's go. <laughs> They're all no sleeping offense. off their hangovers uh, yeah. to this morning. It's Saturday morning. You'd, yeah, you'd, as opposed to the book <laughs> festival, where, where no one's doing that. <laughs> um, but um, one of the things we talk about in my course is that New York literature is about location, location, location. It's about boundariness. And I think you really dramatize that here. W would you talk oh, about the, yeah. the locations and you know, the lines that you don't cross, the streets that you don't cross? Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's, it's terrifying writing a New York novel, yeah. you know, because there's no such thing as a single. There's no such thing as a base hit. Yeah. You know, it's a strikeout or a home run. And, uh, but I, I finally felt I was at a point in my career where I had the chops, I had the mm -hmm. talent to do it. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, New York, for me, I, I refer to as the small gods of place. <laughs> you know? uh, I'm an Upper West Side and Harlem guy. Uh, and one thing I never get tired of, I did it just the other day, uh, is, is walking up and down Broadway. Yeah. You never get tired of it. it it's always evocative and beautiful even sometimes in its shabbiness, mm -hmm. is beautiful. And you know, as the years go by, as they do, some of those places that were sort of sacred to you go away. Yeah. You know, the burger joint on 78th and Broadway where I ate you know, every meal for two years. And, and you know, this club, that corner, as, as it changes, but they still exist in sort of a ghost-like mm -hmm. fashion for mm -hmm. you, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, but boundaries in New York, you know, when, when I first moved up to 104th Street as a young guy, your friends looked at you like right. they were about to give you a wake, you know, like they would never ever see you again. And, and certainly it was small arms fire. And, yeah. you know, it, one of the things that I was walking past the other night, you know, was, well, that was where that guy was killed. Mm -hmm. This is where this person was shot. Yeah. You know, I remember dealing with a, you know, making a small cocaine buy, you mm -hmm. know, on the job mm -hmm. here, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And so uh, it, there were certain things that you didn't cross. And I, I think that that's broken down to a certain extent, you know, but in those days that was an ethnic call, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I'd get out of the subway at 103rd Street on the west side 
were Haitians and on the east side were Puerto Ricans and they were lobbing bottles like mortar right. shots. So you'd come out of the subway putting something over your head. Or uh, when gunfire would start, uh, you know, in my building, I'd get in the bathtub, dry bathtub, and read, because it's hard for a bullet to get through a you know, thick bathtub. Uh, things have obviously changed a lot mm -hmm. in New York, but in some neighborhoods, no. You know, in, in some of the neighborhoods, and I, I'm not at liberty to, to say, but some of the neighborhoods where I went on ride-alongs is still very, very much that way, and the hostility uh, toward police was palpable. Mm -hmm. you, you felt it, you heard mm -hmm. it, you know. Mm -hmm. One of the things that has changed in New York, as so many neighborhoods have gone up, is that the middle class is sort of on the fringes. And, yes. And you've, of course, your cops live on Staten Island. Yeah. I and mean, to me, that's a very vivid picture of here, here are these men and women who patrol the streets, who, you know, try to keep order. Mm -hmm. But they're almost kind of exiled to this island on the fringes. Yes, financially and culturally. Yeah. 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 yeah, for the most part, cops can't afford to live where they patrol. Yeah. You know, which, which by the way, creates a host of, of other problems that are probably too complicated for us mm -hmm. to get into today. Mm -hmm. you know, but when you talk about police policy and things that are going on, that's one of the huge factors. But that's been true in New York for years. You come from Sunnyside, right. you know, huge cop and fireman areas. Staten Island, where I was born, same thing. They used yeah. to say on Staten Island, you had three career choices, you know, cop, fireman, criminal. Okay. You know, <laughs> uh, crime writer. Right, right. <laughs> Close. Right. Uh, you know, and, and there were streets on Staten Island that were depopulated of, of men, mm. you know, the mm. day after 9-11. You know, because there were so many cops and, and firemen who lived there, and you drive down those streets now, still, and and you feel that sorrow, mm -hmm. that loss. Yeah. I want to throw out one more question no, to you, and and then we'll open this up to the audience. But um, yet another thing I admire about the force, you keep that plot going. Um, you do double crosses, you do triple crosses. It's not until the end of the force that you actually can figure out what's going to happen. Yeah. How do you do that kind of plot, that huge sweeping plot where so many digressions? Yeah, it's my least favorite part of the job. Yeah. You know, I, I, I like story, I don't really like plot, mm. you know, but, mm. but you have to have one, yeah. so, you know, uh, they make you. Uh, I, um, it, rewriting, you know, there's, there's an old martial arts saying, how do you carve a tiger? And the answer is you take a big block of wood and then you cut away everything that doesn't look like a tiger. Uh, and that's, that's the case in writing a book like this. It's probably half again as long in manuscript form. And, and I write like really fast, like I'm afraid to get caught on the first few drafts, but long around draft 10 or 11, uh, then I'm really thinking a lot more about structure, about plot, about yeah. the reader and the experience that the reader's having. And you just keep moving it around until it's a tiger, you know? Draft 10 or 11. I'm going to tell my students that on Tuesday. I they, wish it were just 10 or 11. Yeah. You know, it's usually more like 14, 15 or more, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, let's, let's open things up to the audience. I'm sure people have loads of questions for you. I do. Thank you. Good morning. Um, your books are terrific. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask you to sort of Talk about the cartel, which deals with a large, complex, violent organization that is constantly breaking the law. And the force, which is a large, complex, can be violent organization charged with enforcing the law. And, and your perspectives on those two organizations and where they're similar, where they're different, and whether it was any sort of purpose, uh, it might not be the right word, in terms of doing the cartel and then following it up with, with the force in terms of what you're trying to say. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. It's a very astute question. Let, let me answer the last one first and then kind of go back. I had no intent to create sort of a moral equivalence uh, between the force and the cartel. 
Uh, obviously, both are large organizations. Both deal with violence. Both are, you know, are corrupt to a certain degree. Uh, the cartels, the Mexican drug cartels, which I've written a lot about, are evil. They just are. Um, not enough bad things can happen to them to suit me. I, I certainly don't feel that way about the police. And by the way, the force is dedicated to 187 police officers who were killed, murdered, uh, during the time that I was just typing the manuscript, writing the book, not even researching it, you know. Uh, but they both are large organizations, and certainly there are similarities between any organized crime organization and any large police force. They're both hierarchical. They both have resort to violence and force. And they, they are definite subcultures where information is uh, currency, you know? And, and that's what I find fascinating about them. The other thing, of course, is that they have a symbiotic relationship, you know? You, you don't get one without the other. Uh, and they're, they're aware of that symbiosis, particularly on the upper levels, you know? So for a, a cop like Denny Malone and an organization like this to do his job, he has to have relationships with mob guys and with drug dealers. You can't do it otherwise. Same with DEA, you know? You have an adversarial relationship with most of them, but you have to have a cooperative and symbiotic relation with others of them in order to do the job. And that gets to be tremendously morally and ethically and emotionally complex. Thank you. Yes, I, I can't see, so okay. hi. Hi. Um, I first became aware of your work in the 1990s with the Neil Carey books, mm -hmm. uh, the first of which is probably the one that was rejected by Fortune Publishers. It was, yeah. Well, I thought they were magnificent. And you wrote five of them, and I read all of them. And then you stopped. Mm -hmm. So my question is why? <laughs> Uh, I wrote five Neil Carey books. You know, when I first started doing this, sir, I thought that's what you did because of who I was reading, really. I thought you created a character, a detective, and then, you know, you followed it through. I, a number of reasons. One, none of you were buying them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so I couldn't make a living at it. Uh, but also, I, I think I was getting a little bit bored and a little bit boring, you know? Uh, I, I think that the, some, of the, some folks do series tremendously well, and we, we could all name those authors, Jamie Lee Burke and you know, the late, sadly, Robert Parker, and there's so many. I don't think I was doing it particularly well long around book four or five, um, but I might come back to it. I might reintroduce Neil here in a little while. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hello, and Hi. thank you for coming, and also I wanted to thank you for making all of your, thank you for making all of your books available in audio uh, as soon as you do. You're very uh, welcome. It enables me to read them all the same day everyone else does, so thank you. Pleasure. Um, I, I'm curious, you said that you don't really think about the morality of, of what you're writing about. Mm -hmm. You sort of do it factually, but it seems like you must, I, I would imagine you must um, think about that when you're contemplating what book to write, because you write, I won't say sympathetic, but at least you humanize characters from the mob, from you know, the drug cartels, from the police when they're you know, not exactly squeaky clean. And I'm curious how, how you go about figuring out what the next book is. And if you'd like to tell us what the next book is, I'd love that too. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, look, I, I, I pick subjects that I'm passionate about and that I think are important, you know. Uh, I never wanted to write books about the Mexican drug cartels. I, I kind of still don't, uh, but that's what I'm doing next. Uh, I am finishing the trilogy that began with a book called The Power of the Dog uh, and then moved on to the cartel. After both those books, I swore and promised uh, that I wouldn't write another one, and, and I meant that when I said it. I, I was hoping there'd be nothing left to write about. Uh, sadly, there is. Don't don't get me started. You know, I tend to go into rants about this. We're, we're about to build a wall that will be worse than useless. Uh, so I, I try to pick subjects that matter to people. I try to pick subjects that are important. I, I know that I'm a crime writer. At the end of the day, I'm an entertainer. 
but if at the same time that I'm writing a good, tight, exciting book, I can bring people some information or some insight, I'm happy to do that. Now, I have my own ethical and moral ideas about some of the things that these characters do. What I'm saying is that when I'm writing it, I have to set those aside because I can't be objective, I have to be subjective. But the book I'm working on now, I'm 300 something pages deep into it, is the final installment of the Cartel Trilogy. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Don, I don't know if you've got another line here, too. Okay, so. yeah. <laughs> oh, good morning. Thank you good for morning. attending. Thank you. Uh, not necessarily in your current book, The Force, but in any previous writing. I often wonder about this with uh, writers of crime. Did you ever get in a situation where you were a bit fearful of adding something to a book? that it may have personal repercussions on, on you? No, I've never been fearful of that. There are, are some things that I've withheld from books, believe it or not, either because they were so horribly violent, I couldn't deal with them, uh, and or I thought that the reader just wouldn't accept them as true. You know, um, one of the problems with writing about drug cartels is it's such a surreal world, mm. you know? that some of the things happen that actually happened are nevertheless beyond belief. But I've never withheld uh, anything out of fear of my own safety. You know, look, I, I'm not a crusading journalist. I'm a fiction crime writer. You, mm -hmm. No one cares mm -hmm. enough to, you know. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, let me do this and we'll flip flop. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. I was wondering how people continue to do police work into their 40s and 50s. Mm. When I was in my 20s and 30s, I didn't believe I was under any kind of risk at all. Mm -hmm. But I look back, once I got into my 40s and 50s, I wouldn't do that kind of work. Yeah. How, do they, how do police continue to do the work they do? Well, uh, you bring up a very good point. I think it's a young person's job. Uh, and, you know, and there's a reason that, that people's assignments change as they get older and go up the ranks or, or they pull the pin. You know, when, when I was out on the, you know, on the street, you know, with plain clothes guys and women, those, those are young people, you know? The, the great fun of chasing someone down a subway tunnel, you know, it's one of the great bonuses of this job. You get to do, you know, weird, fun things. And it was a thrill, but an adrenaline rush. Uh, but I was tired, you know? Uh, so I, I think that, you know, that, that, that the job, with a capital J, sort of works that factor into it. And, and, and you see men and women, you know, get more desk jobs and more sort of investigative jobs. At the same time, I mean, if you're a homicide investigator, for instance, you know, safe and lofts, robbery, uh, I think that experience, of course, is, is key. You, you want those older people, you know, who, been around the pool a few times. You, you want some gray hair in that room, you know. Uh, you make fewer mistakes. Uh, even on the street sometimes I think it's good to have those people because they have more of a tendency to talk down a situation and more of an ability to talk that situation down as opposed to sort of the higher testosterone, you know, young guy who just got out of the military and is, you know, now on the streets. Thank you, sir. We Thank just you. got a five-minute warning okay. a couple of minutes ago, so. Um, cool. Well, should we go back here and then over here? And does that fair? Yes. Hi. I can't see a thing. Hi. So. This Hi. book was tremendous. I've never read any of your books before, and I have a long reading list ahead of me right now. Well, thank I you. have a question mm -hmm. about the character Nasty, the informant. Yeah. I found him fascinating, uh -huh. and I was wondering your inspiration behind that character. If that was based on a composite of people. Yeah. Yeah, all my characters are not necessarily based on any person, but are sort of inspired by composites. Uh, look, again, I, I, I went out with cops, I work with cops a lot, you, you get to know informants. When I was a PI, I had informants, I had sources. I was such a low-level PI at one point, I would take my informants to Kentucky Fried Chicken <laughs> to, as payment, and if they had really good information, they got extra crispy, you know. That's, that's how down and dirty my work was at a certain phase in Times Square. So I've known those folks, 
you know, uh, have um, empathy for them. You know, uh, one, one thing that's in the book, you know, and a lot of them are, are addicts, you know. Uh, one thing that's in the book that, that's, that's, again, true, you know, is that a lot of cops carry around small amounts of heroin with them, you know, in order to give to informants if, if they're really hurting. I don't want to give anything away, but just how he evolved from your first impression of him to the end it was just fascinating. Well, thank you very much. I, I don't want to give it away either. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. So um, first of all, thank you so much for this book. It's easily my favorite of the year. Uh, oh, thank you. And, uh, it's, it, it's a very New York book, which I think is distinct from just a book set in New York. And you did that really well Thank with you. the Irish Mafia sections and the Power of the Dog as well. Uh, do you see yourself returning to that later on? Yeah, uh, I think that, uh, well, I know that large parts of my next book about drugs will deal sadly and perforce with the so-called heroin epidemic. Um, and Staten Island, which has become known as Heroin Island, so uh, large sections of that book will be returning to New York, as well as Mexico and California, and here in Washington, D.C. It's long chapters of the book, because this book will, because of what's happening, be more political and more about policy battles, as it will about undercover operations and things like that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and then we'll come back. Even though I'm from San Diego, I am going to acknowledge the person in the L.A. Dodgers cap. <laughs> Grudgingly. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I'm curious about your background. It sounds like as yeah, a writer. Yeah, me too. <laughs> it sounds like as a writer, you've had some fantastic experiences uh -huh. to feed into your fiction. So I'm curious how one goes from getting a degree in African studies to being a PI in Times Square, no less. The long way, ma'am. You know, <laughs> look, I I, I'm not, I don't want to be you know uh, ironic about it. I uh, I knew I just needed to make money. You know, I had to pay rent and you know. Uh, and so I tried to do things that were interesting and a little different. And when those opportunities came up, I did that. The, the way I got to be a, a PI was I managed movie theaters in New York City, so you learn all about theft, because all they are are glittering walls to disguise various levels of theft. And so later I was hired to uproot that theft in other theaters, and then I stayed with the agency. Uh, African history, again, your, your career options are tiny, uh, and I, I might have gone in the State Department, uh, but that would have meant benefits in a career and prestige and, and all that kind of thing, and instead I could go and be absolutely broke and be a safari bum and, you know, live from moment to moment, so of course I made that choice. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yes, Dodgers fan. <laughs> Hi. Um, Make really, it quick. <laughs> really enjoying the book. Great, great Thank job. You. Uh, how did you come to uh, uh, write this narrative uh, strictly from the point of view of uh, Denny Malone? Because uh, I've read uh, two of your previous books, also tremendous, and they, they had different points of view. This is all from Malone. Yeah, thank you. That's, a, again, a very astute question. It's the only book I've done that with. There's a technical phrase for it that I'm not aware of. Someone mentioned it, the third person close or something. I, I, anyway, I, I never went to writing school, so I don't know these things. But. Um, the decision, I wrote scenes from other characters' points of view, and they didn't work. And then I realized that what I wanted to do, what I really needed to do, was put the reader, the book starts in a locked room with Malone. You know, you already know he's been busted. And keep the reader just tight with him through the entire ride. That seemed to create a certain kind of intensity and emotion, because when I did write scenes from other points of view, which would have been a lot easier, by the way, from Claudette, you know, and Russo and some of these other characters. It seemed to, to let the tension out of the book. It just drained it in ways that I didn't want and slowed it down. And so I made that decision, albeit reluctantly, to stay just with Malone. I've, I've never done it before, and I don't know if I'll do it again. Thank, Thank you, you for that question. Thank you so much, Don. Thank you so much. Don. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.